Yeah, we've got runners here. Like to, uh, can you outrun a chariot? Could you beat an old man? <laughs> Could you beat an old man in a race? This old man outran a chariot. <laughs> Maybe it says more for the horses. So, uh, he goes through a depression time. I'll tell you what I like about Elijah. He's a common, ordinary man. He's a common, ordinary person. And the only reason that he's extraordinary in the Bible is because he's obedient to God and he does even the tough things. But there's nothing special about this man. He's not particularly emotionally always stable. He's subject to depression. He's subject to distorted perspective. Thoughts of suicide. You know, just about... You know, he's been, he has his highs, but he also has these tremendous lows in his life. I just want to die. And how God deals with him is tremendous. But you know, Elijah stands out, we would say, a giant of the faith in the Old Testament. But actually, he was just an ordinary man that was obedient to some of the most, in some of the most scary times. And that's, all, that's the only reason that he is set apart from anybody else of his day. Just an ordinary, common, run-of-the-mill guy. Do I have any common, ordinary, run-of-the-mill men? Yes, not. We're all above that, huh? There are other things here. Um, we're going to move on. Prophets of the Northern Kingdom, non-writing prophets we're talking about. Elisha would be the second one. And remember, if you want to read about Elijah, you go to 1 Kings. If you want to read about Elisha, you go to 2 Kings. There's a little overlap in them, but uh, nevertheless, in 2 Kings chapter 1, you have the wonderful ministry of this guy, Elisha. Now, Elisha is also ministered to um, by a special family, and uh, Elijah was Zarephath, okay? Elisha will be the Shunammite. Um, woman. So that, some people get those mixed up. I don't want you to mix them up. Here's what Elisha does. He received a double portion of the Spirit of God that dwelt on Elijah. He so much wanted the power of God to be operative in his life that he said to Elijah, Elijah, more than anything else, if I, uh, you're, you're anointing me to take your place. But what I want is the power of God in my ministry. You've got to really admire that, don't you? Here's a man who said, if there's anything I want, it'll be a demonstration of God's power in my life. And, and, and so Elijah says, well, you, you will if, as long as you are here when I go to heaven. And people try their best to, dis or Elijah tries his best to dissuade him and to distract him and why don't you go stay here for, no, 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 I'm sticking with you, buddy. You, sure enough, as soon as I uh, go run an errand, you'll be taken up to heaven and I won't get the power of God that I so desperately want. And so he stayed right with him and stayed with him and stayed with him after test, after test, after test. And because of that, pretty soon here God took Elijah up in this chariot of fire and here he throws his mantle down and Elisha catches it. It's a tremendous story of having your priorities right. If there's one thing, folks, that you ought to desire more than anything else, it would be the power of God in your life. And uh, you can read through 2 Kings. And then the writing prophets. Okay, without looking, tell me what the writing prophets to the north are. What are they again? <laughs> okay. Jonah is a prophet to where? Nineveh. It is an indictment against Israel. Amos, just a sheep herder from Tekoa, has a wonderful ministry. I don't spend a lot of time. What is the thing about Hosea? 
In your book titles, what is, what is um, Hosea about? Unfaithful Israel. Okay, you all need to learn that. What is the key thing, the key handle for the book of Hosea? Unfaithful Israel. And so Hosea is asked to marry a prostitute and take her to be his wife. Isn't it strange? And so God is saying, I'm going to sign you up for anything but domestic tranquility. Um, I'm leading you into a situation that's going to bring you a lot of heartache and disappointment. But I need you, I need you for a special thing because after all, your life is not about you. God doesn't always call people to happiness, but he does call us to obedience. It's very interesting that this man stands out as a fellow who is willing to sacrifice all that a man would want in a faithful and wonderful wife. But in obedience to God, he did the tough thing. Isn't that something? Have you ever pondered that? What he gave up to be obedient to God? And uh, it was an illustration of the unfaithfulness of Israel. Israel was playing the harlot. And by that, what is meant? What do we mean by that? Israel was what? Worshipping other gods. Not being faithful to God. In the Old Testament, Israel is called the wife of God. In the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ. But in the Old Testament, Israel is the wife of God. The unfaithful wife of God. Who is always out finding other lovers other gods to love, whether it be offering your child as a sacrifice to Moloch or worshiping at an Asherah, Asherah pole or whatever it would be, there's this um, unfaithfulness of Israel. The prophets of the southern kingdom, um, let's see if you can say these for me without looking. You all have memorized it. Remember the, oh, I am in herds, JJ. Okay, let's see if we can say them. Oh is what? Obadiah. It started out strong and it got weaker as we went. But, uh, okay. And those are prophets. They don't all belong in this um, single, or in this, um, they don't all belong in the divided kingdom era. But uh, there they are. Okay. The divided kingdom. Of course, we had Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Remember that? And um, we don't need that. I've just given you a chart in there of all the kings. And uh, you'll notice that in dark... Uh, in bold print are the ones that are good. And I want you to, to notice um, some, a couple of things. I tell you what, this is colorful reading. Boy, the, the murder, the assassinations, and the jealousy, and you just name any kind of emotion, you'll read it during the divided kingdom era. And you'll notice I listed down here the dynasties. Sometimes the dynasty was kind of a big mess. For example, during, uh, you had Tibni and Amri. And the interesting thing is that we had Amri appointed as the king. But the people said, we don't like him as a king. And so they appointed, and his, they appointed Tibni. And so there were two kings at the same time. Isn't that awful? That's what they did. And it was, it was kind of like a civil war time, because they were, they were warring, and who's really going to be the king? Well, then, we're not told how, but Tibni dies. And then Omri's the king. So, and then you have Ahab and all the rest of them there. A Jehu, with his sixth dynasty, and you notice his dynasty goes longer than the others. And uh, sometimes the dynasty was real short-lived. All right, uh, those are the notable kings of the north. Um, Jeroboam, we've already talked about the centers of worship. Do you have all that in your notes? I think you do, don't you? Is it filled out? Okay. Ahab was the most wicked king. Uh, we don't have time to go into the stories. We did a little bit on 
And another one that we didn't go into is Naboth's Vineyard. Well, that's a great story to read. Um, here's here's uh, Ahab, he's the king, and he looks out his window and he says, wow, that would be a really great spot to put a vegetable garden. It's too bad Naboth has a vineyard there. So he goes out and he meets Naboth and he says, I want to buy your, your, a vineyard from you because I want to put a vegetable garden here. I got it all figured out. I'm going to put corn here and beets here. And, you know, he's got it all figured out. What he wants to do is he's going to tear up this vineyard, put a vegetable garden in it because it's right next to the palace. It'd be so convenient to just walk outside and you know, grab some, something fresh out of my garden. And he's just got it all planned out in his mind. And, and you know what Naboth says? He says, no. No! No, I can't do that. It would be a terrible thing. This is the inheritance that's passed down. And, and according to the law of, uh, of Moses, I can't give this land to the king. It has to pass on to my descendants after me. So he goes back. He goes up to his, near their bedroom. He goes to bed, and Jezebel comes in. She hears, Hey, Hab, is that you? Are you crying? Yes. What's the matter? Nothing. He's a big baby. <laughs> he says, well, what's the matter? Well, I, I told neighbors I wanted his vineyard for a vegetable garden, and he said no. I told him I'd give him another plot in his place or I'd buy it at a fair price and he won't, won't let me have it. Oh, shut up. Get up out of bed and go eat. I'll go get the vineyard for you. So she goes out and you know what she does. She plots and has evil men of the baser sort um, uh, make up stories about him so that the, all of Israel says, Oh, no, you're a terrible man. And they stone him. In fact, they stone all of his descendants too. So there are no heirs to take over. Well now, the property doesn't have any heirs to go to. So, Ahab, she comes back and says, vineyard's yours. He asks no questions. Vineyard's yours. <laughs>